like a grain of mustard seed. Based on Matthew 13, verses 31 and 32, Mark 4, verses 30 to 32, and Luke 13, verses 18 and 19. In the multitude that listened to Christ's teaching, there were many Pharisees. These noted contemptuously how few of his hearers acknowledged him as the Messiah, and they questioned with themselves how this unpretending teacher could exalt Israel to universal dominion. Without riches, power, or honor, how is he to establish the new kingdom? Christ read their thoughts and answered them, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? In earthly governments there was nothing that could serve for a similitude. No civil society could afford him a symbol. It is like a grain of mustard seed, he said, which, when it is sown upon the earth, though it be less than all the seeds that are upon the earth, yet when it is sown groweth up, and becometh greater than all the herbs, and putteth out great branches, so that the birds of the heaven can lodge under the shadow thereof. The Revised Version The germ in the seed grows by the unfolding of the life principle which God has implanted. Its development depends upon no human power. So it is with the kingdom of Christ. It is a new creation. Its principles of development are the opposite of those that rule the kingdoms of this world. Earthly governments prevail by physical force. They maintain their dominion by war. But the founder of the new kingdom is the Prince of Peace. The Holy Spirit represents worldly kingdoms under the symbol of fierce beasts of prey, but Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1.29 In his plan of government there is no employment of brute force to compel the conscience. The Jews looked for the kingdom of God to be established in the same way as the kingdoms of the world. To promote righteousness they resorted to external measures. They devised methods and plans. But Christ implants a principle. By implanting truth and righteousness, he counterworks error and sin. As Jesus spoke this parable, the mustard plant could be seen far and near, lifting itself above the grass and grain and waving its branches lightly in the air. Birds flitted from twig to twig and sang amid the leafy foliage. Yet the seed from which sprang this giant plant was among the least of all seeds. At first it sent up a tender shoot, but it was of strong vitality and grew and flourished until it reached its present great size. So the kingdom of Christ in its beginning seemed humble and insignificant. Compared with earthly kingdoms, it appeared to be the least of all. By the rulers of this world, Christ's claim to be a king was ridiculed. Yet, in the mighty truths committed to his followers, the kingdom of the gospel possessed a divine life. And how rapid was its growth, how widespread its influence. When Christ spoke this parable, there were only a few Galilean peasants to represent the new kingdom. Their poverty, the fewness of their numbers, were urged over and over again as a reason why men should not connect themselves with these simple-minded fishermen who followed Jesus. But the mustard seed was to grow and spread forth its branches throughout the world. When the earthly kingdoms whose glory then filled the hearts of men should perish, the kingdom of Christ would remain a mighty and far-reaching power. So the work of grace in the heart is small in its beginning. A word is spoken, a ray of light is shed into the soul, and influence is exerted that is the beginning of the new life, and who can measure its results? Not only is the growth of Christ's kingdom illustrated by the parable of the mustard seed, but in every stage of its growth, the experience represented in the parable is repeated. For his church in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. The truth that is hid from the worldly wise and prudent is revealed to the childlike and humble. It calls for self-sacrifice. It has battles to fight and victories to win. At the outset, its advocates are few. By the great men of the world and by a world-conforming church, they are opposed and despised. 
see John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, standing alone to rebuke the pride and formalism of the Jewish nation. See the first bearers of the gospel into Europe. How obscure, how hopeless seemed the mission of Paul and Silas, the two tent makers, as they with their companions took ship at Troas for Philippi. See Paul the aged in chains, preaching Christ in the stronghold of the Caesars. See the little communities of slaves and peasants in conflict with the heathenism of imperial Rome. See Martin Luther withstanding that mighty church which is the masterpiece of the world's wisdom. See him holding fast God's word against emperor and pope, declaring, Here I take my stand. I cannot do otherwise. God be my help. See John Wesley preaching Christ and his righteousness in the midst of formalism, sensualism, and infidelity. See one burdened with the woes of the heathen world, pleading for the privilege of carrying to them Christ's message of love. Hear the response of ecclesiasticism. Sit down, young man. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. The great leaders of religious thought in this generation sound the praises and build the monuments of those who planted the seed of truth centuries ago. Do not many turn from this work to trample down the growth springing from the same seed today? The old cry is repeated, We know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, Christ and the messenger he sends, we know not from whence he is, John 9.29. As in earlier ages, the special truths for this time are found not with the ecclesiastical authorities, but with men and women who are not too learned or too wise to believe the word of God. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-28 That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5 and in this last generation, the parable of the mustard seed is to reach a signal and triumphant fulfillment. The little seed will become a tree. The last message of warning and mercy is to go to every nation and kindred and tongue, Revelation fourteen six through 14 to take out of them a people for his name, Acts fifteen fourteen and Revelation eighteen one, And the earth shall be lightened with his glory.